Saint Ignatius of Loyola's influence is found throughout the Society of Jesus, but through the history of the Society, many others have helped shape the Jesuits into the organization we know today. In the early days of the Society, the public was more familiar with Ignatius's close friend, Saint Francis Xavier. While Ignatius had wanted to travel the globe as a missionary, it was Francis Xavier's expeditions to India, Borneo, and Japan that earned him a reputation as the greatest Christian missionary since St. Paul the Apostle. After Ignatius died in 1556, one of his first companions, Father Diego Lyonez, took over as the leader of the Jesuits. Lyonez and three other members of the society went on to participate in the Council of Trent, and along with Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, exerted tremendous influence over the Counter-Reformation in Europe but the influence of the Jesuits spread far beyond religion. Following Ignatius's example to seek and find God in all things, throughout the centuries, members of the society have contributed to science, art, history, and literature. Along with being the preeminent schoolmasters of Europe, Jesuits also compose textbooks for use throughout the world, spreading scholarship far and wide. The Gregorian calendar that we use today was the work of Jesuit father Christopher Clavius, considered the most influential teacher of the Renaissance. By 1750, 30 astronomical observatories were run by Jesuit astronomers, and today 35 lunar craters have been named to honor Jesuit scientists. As Jesuits traveled through Asia, Africa, and the Americas, they studied botany and medicines, wrote histories of native peoples, translated prayers into native languages, and made dictionaries of local dialects. Additionally, the Jesuits were often advocates for local people who were threatened by colonists and slave traders. In geography, Ferdinand Verbiest determined the border between Russia and China, and Matteo Ricci's contributions to Chinese cartography, mathematics, and interreligious dialogue remain valuable today. Jose de Anquieta is called the Apostle of Brazil and translated Tupi, the country's native language. Peter Canisius wrote a German catechism for Catholics that is still in use today. But the suppression of the society, which spread worldwide in 1773, devastated Jesuit libraries and scholarship. However, thanks to Catherine the Great's protection, Jesuits remained active in Russia. And in the United States, although unable to officially call themselves Jesuits, members of the society formed a civic organization that allowed them to continue some work, including founding Georgetown Academy one of the first Catholic schools in the U.S. in 1789. After Pope Pius restored the society in 1814, the Jesuits slowly began to rebuild their educational ministries. They established schools, printing presses, churches, and social outreach programs. The 1800s brought the poetic and literary genius of Gerard Manley Hopkins to the society. The early 1900s saw Pierre Teilhard de Chardin transform the fields of paleontology philosophy and theology with his prophetic writing, and the American Jesuit John Courtney Murray greatly influenced the Second Vatican Council in its embrace of a more pluralistic Catholicism. More recently, Carl Rahner, Walter Chizek, Daniel Berrigan, John O'Malley, and Walter Ong are but a few of the Jesuits to have made lasting contributions in theology and philosophy, politics, history, and more. You've got these men who are highly trained in philosophy, theology, spirituality, and these other things. What they were always doing everywhere they went was looking for what in the local culture would be a fruitful place of exchange. There are multiple ways that you can engage a culture in conversation. It doesn't have to be through the means of theology or philosophy. Alongside the rich cultural contributions of the Jesuits is the society's painful history of slaveholding. In North America, the Jesuits participated in the institution of slavery from the colonial era until the passage of the 13th Amendment. Enslaved peoples helped establish, expand, and sustain Jesuit missionary efforts and educational institutions across the United States. In recent years, the society has reckoned with this painful legacy through the Slavery, History, Memory, and Reconciliation Project, pursuing transformative change for descendant communities. There's always going to be something in there that's going to be kind of the shadow for you that you, you wish you had done better, or wish you hadn't done it all. When it's true for the heroes of the society as well, who are drawn from a population of 
uh, highly educated white European males and what they do typically is bring their culture with them and they measure the failures of one culture by comparing it to their culture. It's not just St. Louis University is, is a Jesuit institution that is walking that path right now. You can't deny the history of what this institution, the previous Jesuit communities, did to enslaved humans that came here to help build this institution and, and serve those who were in positions to build it. Let's acknowledge it broadly in some very tangible ways. It's easy to just dismiss that and say, oh, well, that was a long time ago. That happened then and this is now and we don't want to create conflict. No, we need to create conflict. We need to acknowledge it so the healing can begin. It's about rectifying, it's about reconciliation and acknowledging and naming. I mean, we acknowledge that we are a predominantly historically white um, institution, as many, if not the majority, of institutions of higher ed are. Some of the symbols, some of the traditions um, were not built for individuals who historically had been excluded. The Office of Diversity, Innovative Community Engagement. Not having that office be the only office grappling with this history of who we feel belongs. How do we enlarge our tent and our love and our journey and our lives to include them? We are part of the community. Perhaps there were some decisions that if we had to do them over again, we would probably do them over again, right? And so we have to recognize our past, but at the same time, we have to look forward and say that, that, that there's hope. I think there's always hope uh, to learn from our past and to become better citizens to each other. In 1917, St. Louis Jesuit brothers William and John Marcoux were influential forces for racial justice in the city and beyond. In 1944, Jesuit Claude Heithouse delivered the famed Heithouse Sermon at College Church, condemning racial discrimination. Soon after, St. Louis University desegregated, making it the first university of the Confederacy to enroll black students. This was the first of many social changes to come in this society. In 1965, the Jesuits elected a Spanish priest, Father Pedro Arupe, as superior general. Arupe ushered in a social and cultural transformation of the Jesuits and was called by many the second founder of the society. Under Arupe's leadership, the society committed to taking action against poverty and injustice. Between 1975 and 2006, more than 40 Jesuits gave their lives as a result of this commitment. Arupe established the Jesuit Refugee Service, an organization that serves and defends refugees throughout the world. In addition, St. Louis University is a proud member of the Jesuit Worldwide Learning Community, providing a digital college education to refugees in African nations. In 2013, Argentinian Cardinal Jorge Mario Bergoglio was elected Pope and took the name Francis, becoming the first Jesuit Pope in history. His leadership has been marked by his Ignatian roots in discernment, commitment to the poor and oppressed, and collaboration between social groups. Y recordemos esta otra realidad, los sueños se construyen juntos. Soñemos como única humanidad, como caminantes de la misma carne humana, como hijos de esta misma tierra que nos cobija a todos. Cada uno con la riqueza de su fe y de sus convicciones, cada uno con su propia voz, pero sí todos hermanos. Pope Francis leads a mission of relationship building, which he terms a theology of encounter. He writes, respectful encounters with those who are different can bring healing and hope to our world. This healing and hope is a vital element of the Jesuit mission, past, present, and future.